Welcome back, folks. Today, we're nosediving into the great stink of 1858, when London transformed from a bustling metropolis to a city-sized stink bomb. This isn't your typical, what's that smell scenario. This is the Thames turning into an open-air toilet in the scorching summer heat. Brace yourselves, we're about to sniff out one of history's smelliest chapters. Imagine Victorian London, where top hats and corsets were the rage, and the Thames was, well, all the rage for different reasons. The river, once the lifeline of the city, had turned into a cesspool of everything unmentionable. If rivers had feelings, the Thames was having an existential crisis. The build-up to this aromatic apocalypse didn't happen overnight. For centuries, London's idea of a sewer system was more out of sight, out of mind, than out of order. Come the 1850s, with a population boom and the ingenious introduction of flushing toilets, the Thames became the unwilling recipient of everything the city had to offer. And by everything, I mean human waste, industrial leftovers, and the tears of overwhelmed city planners. The summer of 58 wasn't just hot, it was like living inside a baker's oven. The heat wave turned the Thames into a simmering pot of liquid nastiness. Even the rats were considering relocation. Londoners, known for their stiff upper lips, found their nostrils severely tested. This was more than a bad smell. It was a nasal nightmare. It wasn't just the common folk who were having a hard time. The Houses of Parliament, those hallowed halls of decision-making, were under olfactory siege. Attempts to mask the smell with lime chloride were about as effective as using perfume on a skunk. The situation was so dire, there were talks of moving Parliament. Imagine the scene. Politicians with handkerchiefs pressed to their faces, debating whether to stick it out or flee the city. Let's not forget the scientific community. Michael Faraday, the rock star of Victorian science, was so appalled by the state of the Thames that he conducted a little experiment. He dropped pieces of white paper into the river, only to watch them disappear faster than a politician's promises. Faraday's conclusion? The Thames was a liquid abomination. This wasn't just a case of holding your nose. Cholera, the deadly disease of the day, was having a field day. While everyone was blaming the foul air for the rampant spread of disease, one man was about to change the course of public health. Enter Dr. John Snow. Not a sword-wielding hero, but a physician armed with groundbreaking insights. Snow pinpointed the source of a cholera outbreak to a contaminated water pump and promptly had its handle removed. This simple yet effective act didn't just halt the outbreak. It rewrote the book on disease transmission highlighting the importance of clean water, a lesson soon to be echoed in the actions of another hero. Enter Joseph Bazalgette, the unsung hero of this stinky saga. He was the visionary who looked at the Thames and said, I can fix this, and fix it, he did, with miles of sewers that redirected the waste away from the river. He was like the superhero of sanitation, minus the cape and the cool name. By 1875, Bazalgette's sewers were a reality, transforming the city and its river. The Great Stink was a turning point, a lesson in urban planning, and a reminder that sometimes, to clear the air, you have to clean the water. So there you have it, the story of when London was the smelliest city on earth. The next time you turn up your nose at a bad smell, remember the summer of 1858, when the Thames was more sewer than river, and Londoners learned the hard way that sometimes, the solution to pollution is, well, a whole new sewage system.